Now let's take another example of your high cholesterol. What's the doctor going to do? Probably not optimize your mitochondrial function, probably put you on a statin. How do statins work? They increase something called the LDL receptor. And once you understand the biology of the LDL receptor, which is how you clear cholesterol out of your blood into your liver, once you understand the cellular biology of this, it will become incredibly clear why if you're thinking about trying to control your cholesterol, you have to be thinking about your mitochondrial function. The following content is not medical advice and is for educational purposes only. The figure on the top is from Molecular Biology of the Cell by Alberts et al., the Bible of Cellular and Molecular Biology. And what it's showing you is that LDL receptors are shown are present on the plasma membrane, which is the outermost membrane of the cell. And they're connected to this green protein called clathrin, which helps internalize LDL with its receptor. When the LDL binds to its receptor, the membrane invaginates and pinches off, and now you have a coated vesicle that comes into the cell. It has to get uncoated, and it moves to the endosome. The endosome is a compartment that accepts things that enter into the cell this way. And the endosome turns it over to the lysosome, which is the digestive particle or the digestive compartment of the cell. It's like the cell's stomach. And the lysosome digests that vesicle, digests everything inside it, and releases free cholesterol into the cell. So this is LDL in your blood. Now it's free cholesterol in your liver. What statins are doing is they are decreasing the liver's free cholesterol, making the liver say, hey, I need more, making more LDL receptor to move more into the blood. What this diagram is not showing is some detail about the motor proteins involved, which is shown in the figure below. You have to think about this. If the LDL particle comes into the cell because it binds to the LDL receptor, how does it actually move into the cell? It's got to go somewhere. And whenever you see movement, think about what I told you back at the beginning. Mitochondrial energy production is what fuels all movement in the body and therefore what fuels the putting things in their proper place. So that LDL particle belongs in the liver instead of in the blood. That's energy produced by the mitochondria that has to move it from the blood into the cell. And we can see this demonstrated molecularly in the figure on the bottom. So the cargo in here is the LDL particles. This is the uh, membrane invaginating to be pinched off. But what do we see here is this brown protein called dynamin. This is a protein that squeezes the membrane to pinch it off. How do you squeeze something without energy? You know, Just imagine if you just completed the most grueling workout possible. All your energy is gone. You can't do anything but lie on the couch. Get a dynamometer and test your grip strength. What's it going to be? Nothing. Because if you don't have energy, you can't squeeze anything. So same thing going on here. This protein is fueled by GTP, which is a close cousin of ATP. In It is essentially directly fueled by mitochondrial ATP production. If you don't have ATP, you can't squeeze this off the membrane. Now, in order to provide structure to this invagination, we have a protein called actin shown as the red fibers. And that actin is going to come around the invagination, provide structure to it, and the membrane has to interact with those fibers. It does so with a protein called myosin-6. And that myosin-6, where else have you heard the word myosin before? Well, if you've taken anything that covered the biology of skeletal muscle contraction, you know that as you contract your muscle, you are using the protein myosin. In the muscle, it's myosin-2. Myosin-6 is just another family of myosin proteins. And what do you need in order to contract your muscle? You need mitochondrial ATP production. What does myosin-6 need in order to interact with these actin fibers? It needs mitochondrial ATP. It hydrolyzes ATP to fuel its movement in the same exact way. Now, inside the cell, you may have gotten the impression in your high school biology class that cells are just a sack of water and things are floating around in it. And if you apply that to how do you clear LDL from your uh, from your blood, you might have thought, well, 
the LDL receptor just falls into the cell and then just swims around. Cells aren't organized like that at all. And if you studied biology at the college level, certainly if you studied molecular and cellular biology, you know this for sure. Cells are highly organized microcosms of society and they have essentially a transport superhighway or a very sophisticated railroad system or however you want to think about it that's made of this blue protein called microtubules. Things don't float around. They bind to the microtubules and they go on certain tracks to get where they're supposed to be. So if we're looking at the top figure and we're saying how does the protein the, – how does the coated vesicle – that carries the LDL receptor, how does it get into the endosome? It moves on the microtubules. And what you see in the microtubules here is you have proteins called dynein and kinesins. And these are motor proteins that help this vesicle walk along the microtubules essentially to get where it needs to go. And how do they do that? They use mitochondrial ATP production to power the transport. Not shown in either figure, the uncoating of this vesicle has to happen, and that is going to happen through heat shock protein 70 or HSP. Every single heat shock protein, you may encounter these in explanations of how sauna works, for example. All heat shock proteins are ATP aces, meaning they hydrolyze ATP to perform a function in involving energy that they harvest from that ATP. So we now have five classes of proteins that are ATP dependent that are involved in moving the LDL from the plasma into the liver cell. And so you can take a drug that's going to target producing more LDL receptors, but that's not going to make the LDL work. If you aren't making mitochondrial ATP, you are not going to be able to control your cholesterol. And if you force your body to move cholesterol from your blood into your liver with drugs like statins, all you're doing if you haven't optimized your mitochondrial energy production is you're taking ATP for that process away from other processes that need it. And one reason that we're going to see why that's not wise is that statins are actually mitochondrial toxins. Now, when you're not taking a drug for your cholesterol, how is it usually controlled? Generally, there are two reasons that you make LDL receptors. One is because you have a scarcity of cholesterol in the, inside the cell. It says, I need more cholesterol. And so it'll make more LDL receptors to bring it inside. And the other is you have a sort, you have a state of abundance in the body. When you have a state of abundance in the body, your brain cooperates with your endocrine system to ramp up your metabolic rate and you want to do productive things with cholesterol and so you move it into cells that, that can use it. You move it into the liver, you're going to make bile acids to support your digestion. If you were moving into other cells, you might be making reproductive hormones, you might be making important cellular structures, you might be synthesizing synapses in your brain and so on. But how is that state of abundance communicated inside the body? At a very high level, think about it this way. Certainly, you need to eat enough food for your body to perceive a state of abundance. But if you have an interruption in your mitochondria's ability to convert that food to usable energy in the form of ATP, do you really have abundance? No, you just have calories that you ate and they can't move. They can't be mobilized to do anything. You might get fat, but you're not going to feel energized and you're not going to have a state of abundance, a state of abundance that ramps up your metabolic rate, invests cholesterol into sex hormones and digestion. You are going to have a state of stagnancy. And so the way that this works on a physiological level is that you consume carbs and calories, and in the pancreas, you make insulin, but you don't make insulin in direct response to carbs or calories. Carbs especially, and calories to a lesser extent, influence the amount of insulin that you make, but the mechanism that they influence it by is mitochondria convert them to ATP, and it is the ATP that is driving the insulin secretion. In your adipose tissue, the same thing is true of the leptin that you make. The insulin and leptin then act on the hypothalamus 
to produce thyroid releasing hormone or TRH, which goes to the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. But how does that happen in the hypothalamus? It's not a direct signaling. It is actually insulin and leptin act on the hypothalamus to increase mitochondrial ATP production and the ATP drives the TRH. And the TRH then goes to the thyroid gland and alongside insulin acts to increase thyroid hormone. And then the thyroid hormone increases the LDL receptor production. Now, in this case, we have genuine communication of a state of abundance that truly exists in the body. And that state of abundance is correlated to the useful utilization of cholesterol. If we start throwing things into the mix, like exogenous thyroid hormone, we will ramp up the metabolic rate, we will do useful things, but we could run into a wall where we are falsely communicating a state of abundance. If we're taking statins, we're not creating a state of abundance at all. We're not even creating abundant signaling. We're creating scarcity signaling by inducing a cholesterol deficiency in the liver. That's on the one hand, they're bringing cholesterol down in the blood in the same way by making more LDL receptor, but they're making more LDL receptor for two totally different reasons. And if you have the choice between operating the state of abundance versus a state of scarcity, you always want to choose abundance. In his 1976 book, Solved the Riddle of Heart Attacks, Broda Barnes reviewed the history of how thyroid hormone was used to control heart disease prior to the release of cholesterol-lowering drugs. And in fact, thyroid hormone could linearly lower cholesterol in the blood regardless of whether the dose was excessive or not, regardless of whether the person initially had hypothyroidism because that's what thyroid hormone does to the LDL receptor. It makes more of it. And if you have – even if you have more thyroid hormone than you need – all that's communicating is that you have an even greater state of abundance. The problem with that was that because the effect on cholesterol was not directly tied to the degree to which someone was hypothyroid, then practitioners got overzealous with their treatment of the cholesterol and they actually killed a few people through irresponsible dosing and that's why it fell out of favor. And you can look at that and you can say, it might be best to start with actually using nutrition and lifestyle to create the state of abundance instead of trying to throw an exogenous hormone in to communicate a state of abundance that's not there. Nevertheless, as Barnes was pointing out, you could be much more conservative and responsible with the thyroid dosing and it would be effective. And in fact, it was effective for decades uh, prior to the 1970s. 